Well, thank you very much, Naveen. It, it really is a pleasure. Kaust is one of my favorite places to visit in January. <laughs> and we're talking about mentors and leadership. And before I start my own talk, I want to give a shout out to George Gokul, who is a generation ahead of me in this business. And a lot of what you're seeing in terms of trying to help younger people, I, I learned from him. So supermolecular chemistry is my core theme along with porphyrins. And when I started in that business, Professor Gokul welcomed me, as I sure, I'm sure he did many other people. And that lesson, repeated by Sir Fraser Stoddard, by Jerry Atwood, by many of the greats, one generation, my old boss, Jean-Marie Lane, that we can never repay these people. And you can probably never repay your teachers. But when you are in a position where you can help others, that's how you say thanks. And, and so this is just continuing a tradition. And I hope I haven't coughed it up and we can continue in the ni nice way. So let me turn to science. Um, let's see if there's supposed to be a little clicker thing. And I'm going to start by thanking a couple of key people, Sir Gregory Theobald and really Jonathan Arambula, who along with Sahid Siddiq have been the um, stars of what I'm mostly going to emphasize. And, and so this is kind of a personal journey to try and use our compounds as metal-based drugs. A and that's really not popular with the pharmaceutical industry, which means it's a wonderful opportunity for academics. So if you hear everybody doing things, that means you should do something else. That's how you can innovate. It's also how you can fail, but uh, we won't talk about that. Uh, OK, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so I got started in the business with porphyrins. And this molecule is called porphyrin. And it has, as you can count, one, two, three, four nitrogens. It's a formally di-anionic ligand. It, those two hydrogens, shown as H, come off. And in your body, it's largely replaced by iron. And that goes into myoglobin, hemoglobin, cytochrome C. It, depending on how you count, there's somewhere between four to seven Nobel Prizes for porphyrin. The, the first actually went to Vilstater, who figured out the structure. And I first came across Vilstater as, as a kid back in um, hippie Berkeley, California, because he was the first one, as I understand, to synthesize cocaine. And, and so this was an inspiration a, as a teenager. Um, but he won the Nobel Prize for that. Hans Fischer for the synthesis, Kendrew Perutz, of course, for the solution to myoglobin and hemoglobin. And so when I personally was working on this with Jim Coleman, Ki Moon Kim, who's here, whether he's in the talk or not, I don't know. He and I share the same advisor, the famous Jim Coleman at Stanford, picket fence, porphyrin, and onward. And that was great. I then went to Jean-Marie Lane, and he had me and the young Andy Hamilton making porphyrin cryptans. And so when I arrived in Texas, I thought I'd keep working. Seven Nobel Prizes, maybe there'll be one more. But I quickly realized, as some of you may know, that in Texas, everything is different. And they're very proud of the fact that everything is bigger. And you can see that in this slide. These are Texas rabbits, a little bit bigger than you find. And, and of course, we're a non-Islamic state, so we drink a lot of beer. And you can see there's five points to the beer. And so it was quickly clear I had to make not a porphyrin, but a texafrin, which would be the right size to chelate the flag. And, and so here's the flag. And, and it's a very simple idea that if you name a molecule after your state, then you'll get tenure. <laughs> and, and this worked. And uh, Professor Kimun Kim and I have a mutual friend, Shumu Zhang, 
who repeated this experiment by making Penn Foss and getting tenure at Penn State, and now he's a big boss back in China. Okay, and so the paper was a two-page Jack's communication in 1988. Um, that's before some of you were born, but it's actually after I was born. And it's the first time the term expanded porphyrin was used in the literature. So this was a two-page Jack's communication. And in 2017 with Furuta and Zaev Gross, we co-edited a special issue of Chem Reviews, which was 1,200 pages. So in 1988, two pages. In 2017, already 1,200 pages. And of course, I'm reaching the dotage of my career. I'm feeling I've done all this work and it's had no impact. But if I take this Chem Review, 1,200 pages, that's almost five kilograms of science and I drop it on your toe, you will feel the impact. So maybe that's as far as I'm ever gonna get in terms of really, okay. I'm gonna talk mostly about texafrins. There, as I said, there's lots and lots of activity. M maybe 22 groups contributed to that special issue. But I'm gonna talk about texafrin and then as time permits, a few other stories. Texafrins differ from porphyrins. Not only are they politically more correct in Texas, they are linked by carbon-nitrogen bonds. And so the chemists, at least the synthetic organic chemists, will recognize that functional group as one that's much easier to reduce than a carbon-carbon double bond. And so one volt difference, what's that mean? It means the texafrin captures an electron much more easily than a porphyrin. porphyrin does not change its electronic structure readily. Cytochrome C works by going from iron three to iron two and back again. And of course, cyanide toxicity comes from binding to that iron three. Here, it's the organic part, picks up an electron. Once you have an electron, it gets reoxidized very easily by oxygen. That makes something called superoxide that dismutates to peroxide and these are reactive oxygen species. So back in the late 80s, early 1990s, this was the boom time for small molecules, things like NO, but also these reactive oxygen species as triggering various biochemical events. And our, our old boss, Professor Coleman, and others are exploring um, Mike Pluth, H2S, so it's still a very major topic. So we m could make reactive oxygen species. We could reduce this molecule, reoxidize. So the next logical step in my mind, and Dirk Gooley shown here helped us do this, the next logical step seemed that we should be able to cure cancer. So this is a personal story. I was first diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 19 or 20. And I actually went to Stanford for medical school, for graduate school in chemistry, because it was right across the street from the medical school. And sure enough, in my third year, um, the disease came back. So that was the second of now three times fighting cancer for me. And I spent a, nine months over the course, nine cycles of chemotherapy over the course of almost a year. And the physician treating me was a young Richard Miller, shown here. And when we made this texafrin, I, I went to him and said, I think we have a very interesting molecule. He was then vice president of IDAC, which became Biogen IDAC. Stock there is trading about $300 a share. Hope you bought early. And we decided to start a new company called Pharmacyclics. And we did a lot of work. And the lead indication ended up being for metastatic brain cancer. That was as much an economic choice because it was an unmet need as it was a scientifically driven choice. And we focused on that. We got all the way through phase three, but then something called Murphy's Law held. And Murphy's Law comes from Irish Americans into the United States. So we have people from all over the world 
we're the classic melting pot country, and they come with a, this law, and Fraser Stoddard says it's something like McDoodle's law or so, in Scotland, so they have an analogous one. And it says if something bad can happen, it will. So this is not a great statement of optimism. Only the Hungarians have beat this in my view. So they have an expression, today is worse than yesterday, but it's better than tomorrow. <laughs> so that's really not optimistic. Okay, so unfortunately, we got all the way through phase three, but the new drug application was rejected by the FDA uh, almost over 10 years ago, and that happened in spite of the fact that 62 out of 64 centers had very good results, but two of the centers in Lille, France, waited almost two months before putting patients on trial. And that, and probably an underpowered study to begin with, led to poor statistics. But there were some nice things that came out of this, particularly the finding that this comp <coughs> compound is hi highly safe. So no grade threes or four toxicities in over 1,000 patients. And sadly, there's still no treatment option for metastatic brain cancer. But at the time, all the FDA cared about was the p-value, or the statistical significance. And on that basis, which is no longer being used as the sole indicator at the FDA, they rejected the new drug application. And as a former cancer patient, where there's still no treatment option, I still, even now, find this decision difficult to accept. But it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> so I, I like this idea. Um, the typical CEO response is, I'm afraid, gentlemen, this doesn't call for a drink, but let's have one anyway. So um, I know and I respect the Islamic mores here, so I would never bring alcohol to the kingdom, but I will bring jokes about alcohol to the kingdom. <laughs> and, and so this kind of happened. I was in a meeting in France. I got on the plane. The stock was $20 a share. Eight hours later, I got off in Dallas, checked the stock price. It was $1.50 a share. And I'm going, this is not good, because that's when the FDA decision came down. And in the United States, we're much more inspired by this yellow guy called Homer Simpson. And, and he, he's saying to alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Okay, so let, let's think about what we're doing in a company. So maybe the most important lesson today for the entrepreneur is business is very different from science. As a business person, your job is to make money. Very different than in the lab, where your job is to finish your experiments, get a nice paper, really love your chemistry if you're a chemist, physics if you're a physicist, and maintain course. In business, we need to look to see how we can make money the quickest. And so we had always been looking at Peter Durbin and Gilead as a kind of role model. And of course, Peter Durbin is a household name in US science, head of the SAB for the Welch Foundation, for instance, Caltech distinguished professor. Many, many famous people have been mentored by him. He started Gilead based on DNA binding, and that didn't really work. And they licensed in antivirals, and of course, Gilead has basically cured hepatitis C. So in 2005, we, we started looking around for backups, and Darren Magda, one of my first students and employee at the company, he spent two years looking for a couple of backups, and Ultimately, we licensed in, we paid $18 million for an HDAC inhibitor, and I think for another $2 million, we got a BTK, or Burkitt tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But the total package was about $20 million. The HDAC inhibitor did not pan out. The BTK inhibitor, after the 
demise of the phase three, there was a hostile takeover by Bob Duggan. Richard was let go. I sort of quit in protest. Darren was fired. Stock was trading at $1.50 a share. Darren had, as I understand it, about $30,000 in savings, no job, and he took the bulk of that money and bought Pharmacyclix stock. He now owns two houses in the Bay Area uh, near San Francisco, so he did okay. And what he did was he brought in these compounds, of course, Richard Miller proved, and then we were all, all moved on. So I'm not supposed to say that we were um, fired, but that, that's the, the less polite way of saying we went on to other opportunities. But the BTK inhibitor worked brilliantly, it was first approved by the FDA in 2013, and as you can see, or maybe saw on the program, um, AbbVie came along and bought Pharmacyclics in 2015 for um, $21 billion. So, so Ki that, that's, that's not Korean won, but even if it were Korean won, it would still be a lot of money. Okay. And this is, we're very proud of the fact that this drug is being used to treat 40% of all leukemia patients. Um, scientists, we never make very much money. It's always the business people. O lawyers always get rich. Um, scientists only get a very small amount of money. But we got a little bit, so I bought a nice lake house. And please come to Austin to enjoy this. And this is one of the nice cars you heard about. There's also a 1966 restored Mustang. And Tesla and all kinds of things. So, um, okay, let's get serious. What did we learn from this failed clinical trial? Two major things. First, texafrin, gadolidium texafrin, incredibly safe for a molecule of its size as judged from clinical data. Second, good localization to cancer. That's probably an enhanced permeation and retention effect. Gadolidium enhances MRI, and so I don't know if we have a periodic table here. Pro probably we don't. Um, but many of you may not know where gadolidium is, so I, I think I have a periodic table. Let's see if I have one. Somewhere I should have a table. Oh, yeah. It's getting... Okay, can, can everybody see that? <laughs> Okay, way down in the bottom is gadolidium. It has seven unpaired electrons. It acts like a little bar magnet, and it enhances your image. And so you can see that for yourself. If you're a good radiation oncologist, you can tell that this poor girl has brain cancer. But if you're a chemist, you add gadolidium, and you can see all the, the lesions. And so that's really inspired us to try and 10 years later bring this compound back into clinical trials. So I think everybody in the room has some personal and professional goals, and those are your dreams, and you should pursue them uh, to the best of your abilities. My dream as a chemist is to bring a third compound into the clinic before I run out of heartbeats. So there are two kinds of doctors in the world. There are people like me who do fundamental research, and that's a PhD. And PH in English is pronounced f, like phony doctor. Then there's another kind of doctor called MD, which stands for money doctor. <laughs> and the goal as a PhD is to pass your compound to the MD, and after that, it's out of your hands. So to try and get it to fit, so that's the goal, is to bring a third compound into the clinic. And that's the story I'm going to tell you. And we're going to do this by using texafrin not as the primary drug, but as a carrier. So this is in the theme of personalized medicine, something that will localize to tumor. And now we'll take advantage of the good localization we saw by MRI. And we'll use that to deliver some active agent. We started with platinum, but of course we want to expand this platinum. I am so old that when I was first diagnosed with cancer, cisplatinum had not yet been approved by the FDA. Think about that. It's now a generic drug. It's maybe the world's best rat poison. And 
It has no specificity to cancer. Some of the other derivatives are a little bit better. Oxaliplatinum reactivates tumor suppressor, P53. But Sahid Siddiq, who worked on carboplatinum before he moved to MD Anderson, he is of the opinion that if we could bring twice as much platinum to ovarian cancer, which is just on the edge of being treated, we should be able to double the survival rate. So that's the goal. So the idea is Texafrin is now an elaborate bus helping bring the platinum tourist straight to the cancer. And that's a problem because normally platinum goes all over your body, maybe two to five percent gets to the DNA where it does its damage. Its resistance involves kicking it out, involves suppressing P53 all over, um, big toxicity issues. It does not go to the brain, does not transfer through the blood-brain barrier. But other than that, really, most of your cisplatinum does not go to DNA. It goes elsewhere to make you very sick. Increasingly in the platinum community, the focus is on platinum-4. Platinum-4 is a higher oxidation state than platinum-2. So those of you who do catalysis have probably been using low-valent palladium to do your buckwall heartwood coupling or Sonagashihara coupling. Always a low-valent metal. Why? Because low-valent, more electrons, doesn't hold on to the ligand, you can get exchange, so you can get good catalytic turnover. But turnover, when you're dealing with a toxic metal, is bad. If you make a high oxidation state, then the other things around the metal stick on very tightly, which means they don't get replaced by biological things, and you don't get as sick. So platinum-4 would be better, because it's less toxic, but then it, in the body, maybe it will get reduced to platinum-2, and maybe the texafrin can be a localizer. So that's the idea. And we think texafrin might help this critical re reduction. So the canonical thinking is platinum-4 comes near tumor. Warburg won the Nobel Prize in the 1950s for figuring out the tumors are a more reducing environment. So could get reduced. Then you're back to platinum-2. That does the classic Lippard coordination to platinum, and that induces apoptosis. And so the question is, will texafrin help? So not only will it localize, will it help with this reduction? And we think it will. So remember, I started by saying we had this very funny reduction of texafrin, much easier than porphyrin. Then it was getting reoxidized by oxygen. But maybe platinum-4 could do the same thing. And we think texafrin would help. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what this device is. Maybe you've seen it in the movies. And again, I'm so old that I know what this is. It's called a typewriter. I had to type my PhD dissertation. Maybe Professor Kimun Kim is just a few years, by then they maybe had word processors, but my, I didn't have to write my PhD. I was very lucky. I had a wonderful undergraduate named Brent Iverson, who's now vice president at Texas. So he went from being my slave to being my boss. But he was a very good undergraduate, and he kindly wrote my PhD for me. That's a very good undergraduate. But he didn't know how to type. So I had to type it. Typing is hard. You push a button, and a little thing comes out. And if you make a mistake, no backspace. You have, for your PhD, you can't use any kind of ratio. You have to take the page out and start again. So it took two weeks just to type the PhD after um, Brent had kindly written it for me. OK, so then a big day comes, put on the cravat, walk in, and I'm hearing my boss, Professor Coleman, talking to another professor. 260 pages, two weeks of typing, da, 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 this, that. And I hear him, the other professor, Henry Talby, going, I th think this is a pretty good dissertation. I read the first 16 pages. 
I'd written nothing, but I had typed 260 pages. He read only 16. Of course, I'm disappointed. He only asked one question. Can you think of another carbon molecule with the same oxidation state as CO2? I got it right. I passed. So then I'm complaining to Professor Coleman. Professor Talby only read 16 pages. And he goes, did he sign your dissertation? And I go, yeah. And he goes, keep it. It's going to be worth a lot of money. Well, 13 months later, who wins the Nobel Prize? Henry Talby. So now my attitude changed completely. Instead of complaining that Professor Talby only read 16 pages, now I'm boasting. My PhD signed by Nobel Prize winner, I'm going to be famous. So it's same data, just different mechanism. OK, so why did he win that? Inner sphere versus outer sphere electron transfer. If things come close, then electron transfer is a lot faster. And a reducing metabolite, like ascorbate, can do that. Now we have a long-lived reduced state that can transfer the electrons. So basically, we have this kind of co cocktail for enhancing it. OK, so how do we test this? We do MTT assay. So we take this dye in cells. If it gets reduced, it opens up, becomes conjugated. You get this beautiful color. So if you have all your cells dead, it's clear because nothing happened. And if all your so cells are alive, it's purple. And you look for where about half are killed, and that's called the IC50. So you plot cell survival on the y-axis, concentration on the x-axis, and the less you need, the more potent. So the more to the left, the stronger the potency. And this is just the very beginning. It's kind of like the TLC of drug discovery. But we can plot this. So if we take the original texafrin, most MG, mo texafrin gadolinium is the USAN generic name, so MGD, that is not all that potent. So you can see that in black. And maybe if it had been more potent, it would have survived a poor phase three trial. And I'd be giving this lecture on my private yacht in Tahiti. But that didn't happen. How about platinum-4? Not a very active form. Again, not so potent. But put them together, there's over an order of magnitude enhancement. Co-administration of drugs is challenging. And so we've made a conjugate that brings oxaliplatinum and texafrin together. So again, the idea is we're going to use texafrin to bring these glorified rat poisons. And oxaliplatinum, the FDA-approved drug here, um, is a little bit better than cisplatinum in terms of its therapeutic ratio, but it's not as clinically widespread. Um, but the idea is that we put it on through an axial ligand. Platinum-4 has six ligands. Platinum-2 only has four, so these guys will fall off and will release an active drug. And so this is what Arambula and Theobald did. There are three reasons we think this is particularly good. The first is we get this tumor localization. Second, using a re platinum resistant cell line, we're able that normal platinum drugs don't work very well. Within error, we overcome that resistance. And that's probably localization resistance, texafrin bringing it to the tumor. And as I mentioned, oxaliplatinum reactivates the tumor suppressor, P53, in a way cisplatinum doesn't. And our drug releases that and has that same secondary anti-resistance uh, pathway. OK, so now we, with luck, we'll be able to bring this to a cancer. We should have better uptake thanks to the texafrin. We should decrease the efflux because it's a different mechanism. We should reactivate P53. And maybe if we're lucky, we can make a transformative difference for patients with solid tumors. So that's the goal. And now we have to go from in vitro cell culture, which we can do, to animal studies. And this is where it gets expensive. So one of these little mouse studies costs about $50,000.
And that, in the United States, we pay our graduate students, maybe like here, Cal, and the $50,000 is what we pay our graduate students. And so one mouse study costs the same as one graduate student. And I, I'm always debating which is a better use of money. And so far, I have not been able to interchange them. So the mice are just no good at running a rotovap or chromatography. And so far, I have not been approved to inject experimental drugs into my graduate students. So they're not fungible, but um, they're the same price. And if you sur survive this, next stage would be um, we'd have to do a whole monkey study. And a monkey study costs the same as my salary. So you can figure out the equivalence between a professor and a monkey is pretty, pretty obvious. OK, so this is working. It works better than oxaliplatinum. So this is the lung cancer sub-Q model. M maybe not the best model, but it's showing it. And no, no change in body weight, so that, that's good. And we can get about three to four times more platinum in on a per mole basis, so that's all good. And then this is a study that had us very, very excited. This is something called a patient-derived xenograft. So this is a cancer. This particular cancer, this cancer, was from a young lady who unfortunately passed away from ovarian cancer. And she donated to science. And this tumor has been kept alive. It's never seen glass, never seen plastic. It's kept alive in the host animal. And then this is done by a commercial outfit called Champions Oncology. They take a small amount. They grow up a new cancer. She died of this. The standard of care for that is carboplatinum. And if you look, carboplatinum does not help, same as vehicle, whereas our drug, and we think the difference between complete tumor growth and no growth is statistically significant. And you see that in terms of a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. We also looked at a colon cancer model. Here, the standard of care is oxaliplatinum. That does some good, but again, statistically significant difference between that and ours, and again, in terms of survival. So th this is all very good. And we're still very much interested in testing reproducibility. The last thing I want to do is get to um, investors, get all the way into the clinic again, and find Murphy's Law hitting us. Uh, and so uh, that, that's a big concern. But I, I have a secondary concern, which is maybe here in Saudi Arabia, there are just not that many, lots of Irish Americans, but there are probably just not that many Irish Saudis. How many of you are of Irish descent? Not, not so many. So maybe you don't understand Murphy's Law. And the first time I came to Kaust, kindly invited by Professor Kashab, um, I was at Yale giving a lecture. And one of my, that was 2017, then I was coming here, then I was going to China. And one of my former teachers, the very funny, Dick Zare, who has probably the best physical chemist who has not yet won the Nobel Prize. And I was complaining that maybe I wouldn't have trouble explaining this. And he said, well, let me give you my slides. So this is Dick Zare's proof that Murphy's Law is reproducible. So remember, this is Irish. Irish people drink too much, and maybe they drive into the ocean. And so then you have a problem. So then you have to get a tow truck. But then, of course, Murphy's Law takes over. <laughs> but this is not reproducibility. <laughs> so we have to check that it's reproducible. OK, so now you have a problem. You have a car and a truck in the ocean. And this is Ireland, so it starts to rain. But you get a bigger truck. It's like the Jaws approach. Uh, that's looking good. But now you still have the first problem. And of course, <laughs> OK, so that's proof that my. OK, so then the good news is that in September of this year, after about two years of negotiation, the IQ Global Group licensed this technology, and it's the basis of a new company. I'm a director of this new company, which is called Oncotex, and 
It's founded around the idea that Texafrin can be this core technology to bring different agents to cancer. And Jonathan Arambula, who really developed this conjugate strategy, he's now vice president for research. And we're very excited. We're hoping that we can, with their help, get this into the clinic in relatively short order. OK, so since this is all commercial stuff, I have to have a disclaimer. So let's read every word of this. <laughs> and it's basically saying blah, 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 blah. OK, now we sign it. It's like updating your Apple phone. Click. OK. OK, let's get on to something new. Um, and I often feel like these guys, uh, oh, oh crap, was that, that today. So I, I think well, um, uh, uh, Jews and I Islamic people were cousins, so we share, of course, the stories of Noah. And um, you can understand why I'm not on the boat. OK. Um, so now we want to target neurodegenerative disease. And so this is a new project led by Simone and James. And the idea is that manganese porphyrins will stabilize high oxidation states and do all kinds of oxidative damage. And the very famous Jay Groves and many others have explored that. Texafrin stabilizes a different oxidation state, manganese 2. That's MR active. And it will deactivate reactive oxygen species, whereas this will produce it. So the idea is that it can be used to see these plaques and then maybe help eradicate them. So normally under oxidative stress, tyrosine starts to dimerize, and iron, porphyrin, is a bad actor. And the manganese texafrin, we think, will bind to these plaques will help us see it by MR imaging, and it will get rid of some of the reactive oxygen species. So the first part, we're making reactive oxygen species. This part, we're deactivating it. And then we'll come back, as time permits, to the third part for, again, making it. And you can see the MR image. And it prevents this oxidative coupling much more effectively. So this protects it to 63%. Porphyrin enhances this or makes it worse than uh, otherwise. So we're doing just the opposite. And these are just more evidence that we can protect not only against reactive oxygen species, but reactive nitrogen. And so the whole point is that with porphyrin, you go to these ferial high oxidation states with the texafrin. You deactivate, you decompose those by cycling between two and three. And that you can actually go back um, by dismutation. And this is coming out in CHEM next week. And that's that brand new wonderful journal being developed by Rob Eagling and, and colleagues. OK, so that's where we are with our Texarin drug discovery. Um, as time permits, I want to talk about one more, uh, one more idea which is gold. Um, before I do that, I like this cartoon because it's reflecting the American diet. And this doctor is saying, who is the last person to see you alive? And this almost happened to me. So I'm reaching my dotage as I'm complaining. A few years ago, I turned 60. And that's like a big birthday in the United States. So I had to have a complete medical checkup to make sure I'm still OK. And I was complaining to my doctor, I'm having trouble breathing because all the radiation scarring in my lungs. And the doctor got really worried. He said, well, have you checked your heart? Because if you have radiation damage in your heart, then that could be very serious. Better go see the cardiologist, the heart doctor. So he writes a prescription. And then you know, in the United States, they give you a little. Then I call up the number. And the receptionist answers. And she goes, who are you? Jonathan Sessler. When were you born? 1956. Why do you need to see the cardiologist? You're only 60. That's pretty young. And I go, well, I had Hodgkin's disease and whole radiation therapy to the chest. Dead silence. After a couple of minutes, she gets back on the phone and goes, 
wow, you've had a good run. I'm surprised you're still alive. <laughs> this was really reassuring. I went to see the cardiologist right away. <laughs> so I want to come back to this idea of manipulating reactive oxygen species. In our body, we have a selenium enzyme. And the older folks might remember before he was famous with the poxide, chiral epoxidation, before he was came famous with click chemistry, Sharpless was using selenium for lilic functionalization. And he'd go around saying selenium's essential. It's in thiodoxin reductase. It has the redox power to reduce thiol. Gold will inhibit this. The reduction thiols, of course, protect against oxidation of stress. So this inhibition makes you more susceptible to that. And Berners Price and others have looked at that. But the trouble is, if you come along and say, OK, we're going to wipe out the ability to deactivate reactive oxygen species, cancer just mutates and finds some other pathway. So you don't get much phenotypic response. And our idea is that we would do a dual targeting. Mechanistic targeting, not physical targeting. So we're going to block one pathway and a couple of others. And what our thinking was, we'll do this by inhibiting the ability to get rid of reactive oxygen species that will attack the cancer, but the cancer can mutate. But at the same time, we'll make more reactive oxygen species. So if you want to wash your face, you go to the sink. And you can put a plug so the water doesn't go out. That's great. But even better would be to turn on the faucet really strong. Then you keep water from going out, and you're adding more water. So that's our thinking. We'll do it twice, two different ways. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with these gold carbines. Let me just skip these. These are early work. It's been published. And get to our new compound. Um, so the idea is that if we can do this double blocking, that will have so much stress, particularly the endoplasm reticulum, it will send out these signaling agents, including calreticulin, ATP, high mobility box protein. That will go and take a mature dendritic cell and say, OK, make more T cells. So those of you following the oncology business know, of course, Nobel Prize in 2018 for the finding ways to overcome how the T cell and the cancer cell hide from one another. So that's kind of a blocking. And that's great. That allows T cells to now come and attack the cancer because the uh, signaling agents PD1, PD1, PDL, and PDL1 are inhibited. But again, consistent with our plug the sink and add the more turn on the faucet, if we can make more T cells, that will also go after the cancer. And so that's the idea. And ultimately, that might even lead to some sort of cancer vaccine. And we just filed a provisional patent, so I can tell you the compound that's our lead. We're calling it Compact Complex 3. And it's considerably better than the platinum drugs. Quinones will make reactive oxygen species. This is going to block thiodoxin reductase. This will be a handle, eventually, for putting it onto some carrier. And we don't need to go through all this, but you can buy little things that tell you that you're getting cow reticulin to the surface. It's very effective. Oxaliplatinum is one of the few ICD or immunogenic cell death agents that's known. 300 micromoles gives that much. One micromole of our compound. So 300 was just as good. So really very, very good. Um, here's ATP, again, much better than the standard of care. So now we get to the real experiment. So if you put, take a small mouse, make them volunteer to a cancer study, you inject a tumor, then come back a week later with another cancer, 
there's no memory and the new cancer grows. But if we could stimulate the immune system, now the first cancer will tell the second cancer, oh, I have antibodies, I have an immune response, and in the limit, you would get no new cancer. So why is this so important? It's a way of maybe going after metastatic cancer, stem cell cancer. We're not gonna go in and vaccinate everybody, but the idea is that if you had the cancer, could kill the primary cancer by surgery, but the small amounts that leak out, you would get by this kind of approach. So let's go to some preliminary data. So if you use 100 micromoles, this is the first injection. The agent's quite potent and you kill the cancer. But that's not so good. Because if you kill the cancer, you don't stimulate the immune system very well. Because the cancer's dead. If you use a smaller amount, you don't kill the primary cancer, but presumably you could pull that out by surgery or radiation. But now maybe you stimulate the immune system. So if you don't have any of this agent, and you come with a second cancer a week later, so one was here and now we're here, within a week, all the animals have a new cancer. You didn't have any protection. If you come along with this high dose, where you basically killed the cancer, the immune response was not very strong, but you get some effect. If you come along with one of the known immune genic cell death agents, ICD, oxaliplatin, 150 micromoles, 80% are tumor-free. If you come along with 10 micromoles of our compound, 80% are tumor-free. So compound three seems to be um, pretty magical. And um, I know we're running out of time. Let me, just for fun, go to some more fundamental chemistry that has nothing to do with um, drug development, but it contrasts this more entrepreneurial, very um, organized approach versus the more creative science side. So I want to just tell a very funny story. Um, and probably you feel a lot like this monkey. Uh, I hate long talks. Um, and this has to do with making a Rubik's Cube. So I don't know why in the world we're making Rubik's Cube. Phil Gale, who's going to come here later. I was giving a talk two years ago, and he raised his hand and he said, oh, can you use your hydrogels to make a Rubik's Cube? So we decided we'd try and do it. And we need fluorescent hydrogels. And it's been a collaboration with Ben Zong Tong. And we need different colors. And at first we tried traditional hydrogels, but that was challenging. And then with Ben Zong Tong, who's famous for this aggregation-induced emission, we found it was easier. Okay, so we want to make a Rubik's Cube. Rubik's Cube is a three by three, and so we need little elements. So I'm showing you a retrosynthesis of a Rubik's Cube, okay? So if you want to make a three by three, first you need a whole bunch of one, one by one. But to make those, you need to make little blocks. And these colors better stick on tightly, otherwise your cube would fall apart. But then you want your cube to rotate so you can solve it. So that's the retrosynthesis of a Rubik's Cube. And thanks to Ben Tong, we have these beautiful colors. We put them in polymers. These are not fluorescent in homogeneous state. So these are all little aggregates. So that, that's how it works. And now we're going to cross-link. We're going to use hydrazin aldehyde. So this is dynamic covalent bonds. We'll start to link these. And the idea is that we can use those to make our first cube. And here are the pretty colors. We'll throw those in. We'll put these together. We'll use strong adhesion, make our blocks. And the idea is that over long time, you get lots of cross-linking. So if you just have one connection, it's pretty easy. Too, it's still, but if you go to China like I like to do, or um, even Korea, lots of good ramen, over time all the spaghetti gets all tangled up. And if you try and use chopsticks, it ends up mostly on your lap instead of your mouth. 
So over a long time, it becomes strong, but a short time, it's weak. And so what that means is we can make something strong and weak using the same technology. And we'll have some movies to show this. So here, I think, is the first movie. Come on, movie. Okay. Um. So we, I need help from the technical guys. They promised it would work, but it's not. Let me run backstage. So the movies are not working, sir. Okay, so th this is a chance for product placement. Well, so <laughs> this is non-alcoholic Coke. Okay, so this is Zhao Fanji, the postdoc who was working on this. You can see, if not Zhao Fanji, you can at least see his hands. And we joke that if he, so we'll try the next one. Let's see if I can get it to work. And I joke that if Zhao Fan can't get a job as a chemist, he can get a job as a sushi chef. <laughs> and you can see he's very quick and very precise. And it's almost lunchtime, so this is making us all <laughs> very hungry. Are we having sushi for lunch? <laughs> so he has to make three by three, so it takes a little time. Okay, so now he, now he has his Rubik's Cube. And it's pretty robust. So now he has to solve the Rubik's Cube. So remember, he doesn't have very much time, because over time this will cross-link. So after about an hour, this whole Rubik's Cube becomes entangled and freezes up. And what's that mean? It means if he doesn't solve the Rubik's Cube in about an hour, he'll have to buy a new one. So if I can't get rich doing drug development, I'm going to get rich making soft toys, get ready f for next Christmas. Okay, so I think we've seen this one. Here's just a different solution. So this is a little more complicated. Again, he's racing against the clock. He, he doesn't get it done soon. It's all going to freeze up. And he's going to have to make, make a new one. Oh, he solved it. That's wonderful. Uh, finally, because we're chemists, we don't actually have to solve the Rubik's Cube. We can cheat. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> much, much better than actually trying to figure out a solution. Just take it out, put it back in again. Okay, sorry. Okay, so that brings me to the end. And this is sort of where we stand with our Texas approach to chemistry. In Texas, everything is bigger. You don't see any, ever see a car in the car wash. You might see a big pickup truck. You might even see a cow in the car wash, but you won't even see a car. So we've made some progress. We have a long way to go, but it's been a lot of fun. And the most important slide is thanking everybody. Zhao Fan, whose Rubik's Cube I just highlighted is here. The drugs lead compounds that we hope will become candidates were made by Gregory and Jonathan. And the new work on, on um, Alzheimer is being led by Simone. And other people on other projects are sh shown here. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much.